think we can go ahead and, and get started. So thanks everyone for, for joining us today. Um, my name is Hector. I'll be moderating uh, this webinar. So we're going to be today talking about um, CCPA and kind of what that means um, to you. So we can go to the next slide. All right. And for um, we're, we have a couple of great speakers with us today. Um, so the first one um, we'll be having is Michael Howden. He is our director, Novacos's director of security services. And just to give a little background um, about Michael. He he was once um, a customer at uh, I shouldn't say a customer. He was once at Orange County um, School District. You know, lived a, a great peaceful life with his family, and and um, we. Novacos happened to be one of the um, customers or one of the people engaged in that uh, consulting with the, the county, and he ended up coming to work with Novacos. And in that time, he's been helping some of the largest organizations uh, really take on data and take on uh, data security. So he's going to be covering um, some of our uh, part of the presentation today. And Ralph Martino is also um, our co-presenter. He's the VP of Product Strategy at uh, StealthBits. I've known um, Ralph's a longtime friend of mine. I've known him for about three weeks. Um, in that time, he's you know we we've been working a lot together with uh, with with the CCPA and, and this uh, webinar. Um, and before that, he worked at one of the um, larger consulting firms um, and helped a lot with uh, managing risk and and really um, touching on uh, sensitive unstructured data has been his specialty. Um, so you know he's been in the business for over 21 years. And um, yeah, he's going to be one of our, our speakers today. So we'll we'll go into the agenda next here. All right. So um, part of it's going to be covered by uh, Michael, as I mentioned. He's going to be covering kind of what is CCPA and, and what's you know what are the what you know what data is underneath that and what 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 are the penalties going to be. Um, and then Ralph's going to cover you know what does that mean from a business standpoint. So you know you and you guys in IT, you know what do you have to do immediately in order to to take on some of these new challenges? Um, so I think with that, uh, oh, and another thing I want to mention too, if you guys have any questions, you know feel free to put them in the chat box, and we'll we'll either address them during the presentation or at the end. Um, we'll we'll save some time for Q and A, and don't be afraid. There's there is no dumb questions. Um, I had a customer actually yesterday ask me what an endpoint is. Um, so we love the softballs. You know, there's no dumb questions, so um, yeah, please just use the chat box. So with that, Michael, I'll let you kind of uh, take over and, and tell us a little bit about what CCPA is. Great. Thank you, Hector. So what is CCPA? The California Consumer Privacy Act uh, is really the first comprehensive privacy law enacted in the United States. It's not the very first information privacy law. Uh, we got that back in 1970 with the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So we've been doing this for about 50 years. Uh, but what CCPA is doing is adding a variety of privacy rights to California consumers um, and really setting a precedent for other laws. It came on the heels of GDPR, uh, went into uh, law June of 2018, and uh, it started being effective actually in January 1st of this year. Now, the Attorney General, who's the enforcement agency, will not begin uh, looking at companies until July 1st, so you have a whole five and a half months to work on uh, compliance. Um, so what are some of these rights that um, CCPA is, is giving us? Uh, some of them are uh, how businesses collect, use, transfer, and sell the personal information, um, disclosures to consumers prior to that, making sure that uh, we understand the categories and purpose of collection. I myself am a California resident and consumer. Um, and I've gotten a number of these uh, updated privacy policies. I see a whole bunch of different um, cookies and things that, that are on websites now that allow me to say yes or no to tracking, um, you know, access to uh, our information and the ability to ask to be deleted, things like that. So, so we have specific opt-out rights. We have, uh, for minors like my kids, there are actual opt-in rights. They can't actively sell uh, any of my kids' information without my consent uh, for anybody under 16, which is great. So I did mention it came on the heels of GDPR. So how does it compare to GDPR specifically? Uh, GDPR is fairly broad in scope. Uh, it's any personal data that gets processed. 
um, by companies that, that have EU citizens, where it's really, for CCPA, it's California residents and, and consumer data. It's not just the fact that I live here, it's a business that, let's say I buy from an online business, they know I'm a California resident, they would actually fall under CCPA. Um, and it's, again, it's only personal data around the, the consumer side. Um, and there, there's some question about employee data. That is an amendment that will be coming likely at the end of this year and going to affect probably uh, 2021. So any companies that have California employees or business to business data, that's likely to go in scope fairly soon. Um, and I'm not gonna read each of these bullet points, but um, again, GDPR is fairly broad and has some opt-out where CCPA is fairly narrow and has uh, opt-out, opt-in. Um, as far as like penalties, uh, the difference is um, GDPR is 4% of global revenues where uh, CCPA, we as consumers have a floor and a ceiling of what we can sue for um, and the attorney general can, can do much more damage there. So we can go on to the next slide um, and we'll talk a little bit more about violations. So which companies are affected? Uh, you have to meet at least one of the following thresholds. You're, you're a for-profit business that has gross revenue larger than $25 million, uh, receive as a data processor or disclose um, personal information of 50,000 or more California residents. Again, it's consumers, um, but it does apply to devices, households as well. Um, or the company makes 50% or greater revenue from selling uh, personal information. So if you look at these um, fees here, uh, if we look at the bottom one, so there's unintentional and intentional. Uh, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about that real quick. So the unintentional is you know the company is, your company is uh, gonna fall under CCPA. You're taking steps in your program to find this data, to um, identify it and make it so that people can, can look up what they have, what you have there. Um, and something a breach happens right so that's an unintentional they'll say okay you're taking the right steps where intentional is cc you, you fall under ccpa and you're not doing anything about it the, it, the fine is triple the amount um you know even a thousand records of an intentional violation seven and a half million dollars so that's probably not uh specifically something that people want to get caught with um, now how has this really set a precedent for other states and even federal um, there's actually 17, 16, 17 other states that have bills that they're working on and have either done a dry run like the federal to try to pass these bills to see, uh, you know, who would agree to it, what reform they'd have to put in. Uh, the fact that we have five federal bills uh, is actually quite great, I think. Uh, I think just overall data privacy is something that we really need to work on as a country. Um, a couple of things that I'll mention about the federal side, uh, one of them, uh, 2366 would make the state's chief privacy officer into a four-year statewide elected position. So they're taking that serious. Um, you know, 2363 ensures that individuals own and have control over their biometric identifiers, such as their face and voice. I mean, that's huge. So we have to be able to identify, track, um, you know, delete potentially a lot of this data. But what does that really mean for the business and on the, on the IT side? Um, let's hand it over to Ralph to have him go through that. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate that. That's the slide. Thanks. So, I mean, it sounds very easy, right? I, I think we just go out there and we buy a technology, we pay for some services to get it up, and problem is solved. And while that's meant to be a joke, there are still folks out there who operate in that, that fashion. Uh, you know, the demand right now with keeping up with the pace of the business is making sure we understand what the business needs to be successful, that we understand what those use cases are that we're solving for. A lot of times we are just buying technology. We're buying technology to meet a checkbox in an external audit or internal audits spreadsheet, and we are not getting it implemented where it's providing value to the business. <laughs> or even some other times, they need something that the technology can't produce. And then they're left wondering why we bought the technology and you're having to do rip and replace things. So it's really getting the business involved and making them understand that this is a business problem more than a technology one. 
And we have to go ahead and move at the same pace as the business wants us to. And that becomes a problem. A lot of times when we get into these big programs, identity and data programs, we fail to look at some of the underlying processes and even platforms that we use in a business today. There are a lot of times that onboarding processes from the business are different than the onboarding processes from IT. There's a lot of times that the active directory has gone neglected. We were never given budget for projects we pushed because we couldn't prove ROI to the business. We've had mergers and acquisitions. The team has changed, it's a new team now. I don't know why that is configured that way. So what happens is we run in these roadblocks halfway through these big programs and we're having to untwine things. So we have to actually get them connected and start really understanding what everything looks like so that we can start moving at that pace. But the new demand and change is that it becomes a shared responsibility. In large organizations, a lot of times you're talking to an identity team and then you're talking to a data team. And they need to realize that it is one thing that the business needs to manage now. And it's really a business problem, not an IT one. I read somewhere that if the business manage their financial assets like they do their data assets, there would no longer be a business. And that's true today. And so we've got to break down those silos. But not only breaking them down up, down, and sideways, we have to partner within the organization because this becomes a, part, a problem for the business. We have to partner with people like HR. Uh, we, we want the business to do something, right? We want them to be data owners. What does that mean? Or we have to partner with teams like legal and compliance to maybe show them that, hey, we have risk with this information that hasn't been used by the business for 12 years and help them champion us for getting that information off the network. And really that's it, right? It's learning how to speak that C-level language, risk and ROI. It's really making them understand that there's a business challenge in front of us, we need to get you involved, and that we're gonna to have to work out some of the things that we've neglected so that we can move fast and get this solved for you. Next slide. I think it's, you know, it's really easy these days for folks to come out there and say, well, they discovered data, right? They, they do these scans, some of them very good, some of them not so good, but we're really gonna to have to change the way we're starting to look at the information that we're scanning for. We're really going to have to start understanding is, is that a consumer social security number that is exposed to the everyone group? Is that an employee birth date that everyone in the, or in the research department has access to? We're going to have to start to understand the subjects around the data for us to start moving faster. <clears throat> Tagging is also going to become something. This is not a technology issue. Tagging software has been around for a while, but the problem is, is really allowing the business to understand how it's supposed to do this. What does it mean to tag these assets? And then having the right structure in place to make sure that the tagging is being used by all the other systems. And that the tagging can be seen by our protection systems, our governance systems, but even more so can help enable digital transformation. So tagging becomes a little bit more than just a security one. And this is again, where we are dealing with a business problem that has to be addressed holistically. And improving what we're doing with technology. A lot of times we're putting technology in there that's getting, uh, struggling with false positive rates. They're struggling maybe to, to work effectively. Uh, and we need to get better at showing the business an ROI faster. And that means addressing upfront what's going to be needed by both parties and making sure the technology is fit for purpose and we achieve what we need to do. But after discovery, you know, you have to figure out what to do with this mess. And you have to, next slide, you'll have to go ahead and go through most likely a process. You know, the, before you, in the next 24 hours, get the business involved and get these use cases defined, there are some things you can do, right? We can go ahead and do things like this, discover the obvious. Let's figure out kind of where the sensitive data lives. Let's figure out where it's at and who has access to these assets. We're gonna to wanna to take the time to enumerate who has access to assets that are sensitive. And we're gonna to wanna to have a, a report or a knowledge of who has access to assets that are sensitive and stale. 
Stale meaning they're no longer providing value to the business, right? Data is the only asset in the business that appreciates with use. And it's the only asset in the business that is not destroyed or removed when it's no longer creating value to the business. So we're gonna to have to start enumerating where it's at, who has access to it, and start really working with our teams to kind of start reducing risk, taking away things like the everyone group, removing stale data where it's appropriate, and archiving it where it's needed. From there though, we still have another job to do. We still have to continue to minimize the risk in the environment, and that's about getting to least privileged. It doesn't matter what business you're in, any business to operate are going to have individuals who need to have access to information, to data, to sensitive data. People processing finance, building, HR programs will need access to employee sensitive data, consumer sensitive data. It's how the business operates. But what we need to be able to assure and honor that the right people have the right access to the information. And that's when it's in the app, when it's in the structured format, and when it's in the unstructured format. So after we find where these assets are, we know who has access to them, we start working to find a data owner. Someone who can take ownership of who should have access because for years, access has just been granted by IT servicing a ticket. They had no idea what the asset was used for or why this person needed access. They were, not, they were the default owner. So we wanna put that back into their hands. <clears throat> I mentioned Active Directory really being a problem and having to really dig into some of it sometimes to make sure we can enable the business. When we think about how access is typically granted to unstructured data on your file shares, it's through Active Directory and it's through groups. And sometimes those groups were created at the very start of the business when everyone was on two floors and it was floor two and floor one. And the business grew and different people needed different access. They needed access to printers and different resources and they were grouped in different ways. Well, now you need to be able to say, hey, how are users using our data? How are they using this data set? And we need to be able to put them in chunks and provide them the right access to the data. They shouldn't be able to do read, writes and deletes if the primary function and all they do are reads. And we have to do that in an automated fashion to again, move as fast as the business needs us to move. <clears throat> and then allow them to attest on that. Hey, maybe I did a lot of reads, but maybe I shouldn't have done a lot of reads. Well, the business owner has to attest to that and go ahead and remove me from that group. And that's when we get into that attestation for access. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. But it's really going ahead through a process by which you can prove you have a least privileged control over sensitive information and that you have processes in place to remove access when it's no longer needed. Next slide. So what will the auditors be looking for? Well, fully for me, the auditors are gonna be looking for transparency between the business and the consumer. And I think some of these companies, they're already doing that. Folks like Uber, Microsoft, Apple, they don't care what state you live in. They are giving you the right to see and be transparent with you, the types of data that they collect. And they do it in a very simple way. I mean, anywhere you live today, if you're in Illinois, New York, Florida, you can go to Uber right now and request your data. They're not waiting for other states or the 18 states to come out with something. They're going to be fully transparent with the consumer. Can you advance a graphic? The other piece of this is really letting the consumer get control of their data. This is a sample of data that Uber collects. And so I have to have the ability to control the type of information that they collect, how they go about collecting it, why are they using it, what's this purpose for? And then I have to make sure that the protections are equal to the value of the data. I mean, if I was, if I downloaded this information and my, 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 fiance watches a lot of true tv id tv wives with knives all these different shows if i happen to be someone who wanted to commit a crime of such nature maybe i could determine a pattern of where someone is located where they go to most where they visit the most where they get picked up the most where what time do they get picked up what time do they get dropped off that would be, be paranoid i'd want that stuff removed I wouldn't want any of that data on myself 
given the fact that just my paranoia uh, of simply having someone stalk me. Yeah, what's know, interesting, Mike, Ralph, you, yeah, I was going to say what's interesting is that for a lot of these different applications, I actually like that they have my data and can present me with either different coupons or advertisements, uh, things of that nature that may, might be relevant to myself or my family. Uh, but I do have an expectation of protection, right? I don't want them to share that with an unknown entity um, and, and p potentially looking at other um, businesses that might take that data and use it for nefarious reasons. There's plenty of uh, movies and things out there now about what happened with Facebook and, and all of that. So people can, can go find that. So I really don't want that to happen, but I don't mind me opting in to, to say, present me with this this coupon or this advertisement because that's kind of the experience I want. I, I can't imagine how good the UI would be or UX would be if, if you know, they didn't have that data. If it was all anonymous. Yeah, I'll take a, I'll take a McDonald's, you know, coupon any day, just as long as they don't tell my insurance company that that I accepted that gift. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, and I also think you hit on a, on a, on a good point, Mike. I, I think it's it, uh, it's really having it to where. Um, they're catering to your needs a bit, but also when you leave that app, when you're no longer a user of that app, I would think that having your information deleted would be important to you at that point. Maybe it's not the paranoia stance I took, but you know, to your point, cater to my needs, send me that coupon, but when I'm no longer using your application, delete my information. Yeah, and you're getting into understanding everything that you've just talked about. You're understanding the data life cycle, how they're using it, processing it, potential retention and destruction of that. So I think that's why it's really m the most comprehensive, uh, you know, privacy law at this point. And that's why I think there's going to be much more of these coming down the road, as we've seen already. Um, just because, you know, I want to be forgotten or maybe I don't want them to, you know, track what my kids are watching on YouTube and they are already, you know, there was a huge fine there by the FTC to Google and YouTube um, over targeting children with advertisement, right? So we should be able to, as people, have the fundamental right to our identity and, and all of our personal information and say, you can't have this. All right. So you guys, everyone should now have a pop-up quick poll. So big question is, you know, from your perspective, you heard a little bit about, you know, Michael's perspective on data, um, Ralph on their personal data. So how do you how do you guys care about your data being shared? And again, as you guys are, you know, kind of filling out these questions, make sure uh, if you have any other uh, questions, we're about to get to to that part. Um, so yeah, just make sure to put them in the chat box. Uh, another thing to mention too is you will get a, a ISC squared. CPE uh, credit for, for this webinar. All right, so here are the results. Most, of pe most people, yeah, 80%, oh, 79% uh, said yes, they do care about you know, how their data is being shared. Um, and then 5%, yeah, they don't really, 5 don't really care. Um, and 16% are, kind of depends, so they're not really sure depending on uh, the exact context. Yeah, what's what's yeah. interesting too is that you know, and, and a lot of us do care about how it's shared and with whom it's shared. But there are some exemptions to CCPA for the sale and opt-out control. Uh, one of them is like service provider or contractors. So even if a consumer is elected to opt out, they can continue to transfer that um, information to third parties who who fit that exemption. So that's where at some point, you know, just need to understand from a business and a personal perspective, you know, as we get through these steps, there's still some gray area, get legal involved, get compliance involved, have a plan, right? There's going to be some, some things that um, are going to have to change going forward. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. It was interesting, and here I thought it was just because most folks were paranoid about the latitude and longitude of that information, but I guess not. Uh, so I think we're, in summary, and how I would kind of maybe sum that up, Mike, I, I think I'll just take a crack at it and let you like finish it off, if you will. But you know, I think that you know, privacy is going to have no vertical. Uh, it's really going to hit all industries in a very different way than ever seen before. I also feel that like we'll see, you know, as Mike said, more regulation coming down from the Fed. And in those cases, we're going to see where 
terms or language may be written very loosely and, and folks are going to have to be uncomfortable and comfortable with being uncomfortable in light of that when there's no direction making sure that you have something that you're solving for a business purpose and a business reason there'll be those regulations that are very rigid and some people feel very comfortable there but what i see with these are very loosely written regulations especially what's happening in new york in march and people are going to have to be comfortable in that, in that uh, you know, uh, fluidity, if you will. And they're gonna have to expect to get audited. So someone's going to be made the example. Uh, and that's really when you're gonna see behavior kind of really change. Mike, I didn't have, I did okay, anything else you wanna maybe sum up? No, that's great. I think just to add to that, um, you know, if you're not sure where the company stands at this point from a business or technology standpoint, you you should get an assessment and and start working towards um, that roadmap of where are we today and what do we need to do to be compliant? Because CCPA does have an enforcement rule that you don't have to do it once. You have to continually enforce this. Um, you'll need a process to efficiently respond to uh, the, the DSAR requests, right? If I, if I say I need to know what information you have, you have to be able to respond to that appropriately and completely. Um, there should be some sort of uh, tools and, and, and interviews happening with the workflows like Ralph mentioned. Um, you should be tagging that so you can track that as it goes around the environment. Obviously encryption, there's other con you know technical controls that should be in place. There's really just building out that, pro that program for privacy and protection going forward. Um, and just having that business buy-in at the C level that says, yeah, we agree it's, it's a business and a technical problem. So how do we come together um, just overall, you know, to comply with potentially GDPR, CCPA, if a federal one gets passed, there might be overlapping and um, compounding fines, right? So what's the risk tolerance of that? Whether your intentional or unintentional violations get put in there. So just start making steps to success. And I think that's the key at this point. Yeah, getting the, to getting the business involved and the policies written down and boom getting some of those dots connected are going to be helpful. You know, I think when we I walk through the uh, access to data at rest, but, you know, I think a lot of those lines of data mapping, right, people are going to have to start managing this data in a different way. They're going to have to think about it at creation. You know, how do we look at data going forward? How do we look at the assets that have already been created? Uh, how are they stored? Who has access? We went through a little process around that and also how it's moving in the environment, how it's being used in the environment, but then ultimately archiving and, and, and destroying it. I, I think it, moving it through its life cycle and understanding it along those paces is really going to be something that's going to be value to the business going forward, especially when you think about all the regulations. Perfect. Yeah, I appreciate um that I think uh, we have a couple of questions here. Actually, well, before we do that, um, as we're loading up those questions, one thing we can do is, uh, uh, you know, obviously thank you guys for that entire presentation. As you guys are writing your questions, I'll talk a little bit about, I'll kind of take a step back and tell you a little bit more about us as a company. We wanted to start off with uh, the content that you were interested in, which is the CCPA, but now I'll tell you a little bit more about Novacoast. So, you know, we've been in business 23 years. Um, in that time, we've you know, specialized specifically around cybersecurity and identity and access. Um, and think of us as the engineering and development services groups. So everything from, you know, the advisory side of the house, so us going in there, doing a, an assessment of your cybersecurity management program and helping you build it, um, a maturity roadmap over the next three years or five years, depending on, you know, the results of that assessment. We have a group that focuses solely on that on that aspect of it. Um, and then we have our engineering services that focuses more on the implementation of some of these technologies, um, configuration of your tools, making sure everything is working um, as best as it can. Um, separately, we also have a development services arm and they work with you know doing these custom uh, integrations and custom connectors to make sure that all of your um, systems are all you know under one single pane of glass and you have a, a, a good control over your um, your IT environment. They also do you know other types of software development within that. 
Um, and then on the other, and kind of the last piece I'll talk about for, and for this case is um, operations wise. So that's our managed services group. And we take a really different approach with managed services than most organizations. We have a co-managed approach, meaning that you as the customer has full control of your data, of your, of your tools, and really what we're doing is working as an extension to your team, um, leveraging our SOC, our, our SOCs. So we have four SOC locations. One of them is in our headquarters in Santa Barbara, uh, California. One of them is in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And then we have two global ones, one in Manchester and one in Latin America for our global presence. So that's a little bit about Nova Coast, um, the background that, that we, that, um, we have come with and, you know, Michael's a big part of that team, you know, talking to CISOs and talking to, you know, large healthcare and financial organizations to take on, you know, a, a lot of what we're talking about. He helps them firsthand. Um, and Nova Coast is, you know, a, a big part of that. So that's about Nova Coast. Ralph, do you want to tell us a little bit more about uh, Stealthbits? Yes, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. So Stealthbits is a great little software company, and I think they use great because uh, I truly believe that. But Stealthbits is a software company. We're really focused on our mission, which is protecting an organization's sensitive data. We don't care if it's structured or unstructured. We're out to discover your sensitive assets and then enumerate the people and uh, credentials that have access to that information. But that's just a compliance check mark for most, right? That just ensures the right folks have the right access to data. What we also want to do is make sure those credentials are secure and making sure that the identity is secure a little bit more deeper than just the access, but how attackers may exploit one's credentials to leverage that access. So we really believe that compliance and security can come together and be met. Uh, the other topic, I'll, or the other thing I'll point out is uh, we align to most projects, right? And at DLP, we enhance information by knowing the contents of data. We're also able to provide DLP information on an incident. So when something occurs, who do they call in the business? Who owns that asset? We also enable IAM programs, SSO, IGA. We slip right in there as well with our DAG tools and any real project that relies on Active Directory, we're going to help, get you straight, help you straighten it out. And the last bullet is we're probably held self-funded. And I think that's important to note that we don't report to a board of directors. We report to our customers. And that's the only two things that this organization is focused on is our customers and our employees. And we're a small company, but we have a global footprint, and our headquarters is based out of New Jersey. Yeah, and we're really similar in, in that sense. I think that's why, you know, this partnership is, is so important to us. We're, you know, small, privately uh, held and self-funded as well. And I think that it is, it, it truly shows the, the company culture. I think we get a lot more innovation and, um, yeah, the focus is purely customers. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, all right, so we got a couple of questions. I'm going to um, start going through actually a good amount. So the first one is, uh, is it calendar days or business days for the quote days measurement? Uh, I know that they have uh, they, they have to give you it's 12 months of information that they have to report on. Um, not sure if I've got something on specific amount of days. Okay. I would I, come back to that. I don't think we spoke on days. Yeah, I don't think we spoke on days either. But if days is in relation to a DSAR request or data subject access request, uh, Michael, please uh, confirm. But I believe it's you have to respond within 45 days. However, you can request an extension for an additional 45 days, making it 90 days to process that request. But I don't think we brought that up in our presentation. Okay, and then um, the other one, what do you recommend for handling, handling the third and fourth day party obligations under CCPA? I'm not too sure how, 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 to, how to, they want to address that, but, but most of those third parties will need to have some sort of assessment, and, and definitely you'll want to have some kind of language and coverage legally that allows you to understand how they're going to use that data, because ultimately I think it is your responsibility. Okay. Yeah, whoever um, asked the day's question, maybe you can elaborate a little bit there. Um, and all right, let's do this one. So CCPA, does CCPA currently have any auditing requirements? 
Well, I mean, auditing in the fact that you need to know what, you know where the data goes. It doesn't have anything specific that says a company has to audit that information that, that we've seen. Um, again, this is where go, digging into it from a compliance or attorney perspective is good. Um, that said, we're not the attorneys and not giving you legal advice. We're saying you should engage your <laughs> corporate people for that. Um, okay. But I haven't seen anything specific around just auditing the data, other than the fact that you just need to know where it's at so that if if a subject, you know, access request comes in and they say, what do you have on me, that you can go find that. Okay. And then another one here, uh, can you talk a little bit about um, tagging what, what file types should be tagged? Bob, again, I think that's not going to be based on the business process, right? You, you're going to simply put some of them might want to tag it as consumer data, some of them want to tag it as employee data. Uh, you know, as your business is maybe creating content, you'll want to maybe classify it as corporate confidential. It, it's really going to be based on what the business standards and policies are and, and what you're looking to solve for. I, I don't think there's anything I could say, this should be tagged this way, this should be tagged that way. It's a really working with those lines of business to understand what, how the information is going to be um, located, addressed, and managed with these tags. Okay, great. Yeah, and the easy one is really like if it's an application with a database, obviously there there's some different ways to understand how the information comes out of that database versus file types. If you have people that export that data out of a database or application into spreadsheets to work on analytics or other things, um, then obviously, you know, however, whatever file types are working on that, there are different tools and mechanisms to tag that data to track it via DLP and things like that. Okay, great. Um, and then another one, Ralph. You talked about identifying a data owner. Um, how does how should some, how does one do that? So on the unstructured side of the house, a lot of the technologies will do this for you, right? They'll do that with different algorithms and different, uh, you know, what I'll call secret sauce within the application to help the business identify or help so, uh, IT even identify who could potentially be an owner and assign that owner to the asset. So it's typically done, you know, with unstructured, it's kind of hard. It's typically done with scans. Uh, and, and it's typically done by watching activity on the file and then making sure that uh, we can make a recommendation based on that activity. Okay, great. Thanks, Ralph. Um, this one uh, this might be better suited for Howden. Um, how do you see this affecting, like, other security programs in your experience? Um, it, so it depends on where, what the maturity level is of the existing program, uh, which is why, you know, I, I said an assessment uh, first is sometimes good because then we can say, you know, which framework are you aligning to? D does your program align to NIST? Um, maybe you're already doing GDPR or ISO 27001 and you're pretty close uh, in, in the way that you handle data to begin with. We just need to identify that it's, say, like a California consumer and potentially tag that as PII, you know, dash CCPA, and then now you have that set aside. Um, you know, it, so it, there are some different effects because of the way that the data is handled and processed. Uh, likely, you know, it, the indexing side of that, how you how you're tracking and, and um, finding that that CCPA data, I think, is what's going to be key because most companies you know, aren't all that great about, uh, you know, where their data sits and what's in it. Um, so I think it's going to just enhance what people are already doing for privacy and protection. And again, you might be already close, you know, that's why it's really good to work with governance, risk, compliance, and legal, just so that you can understand if you're, you might be 70% there already based on your the way that you handle DLP and, and classification and, and information protection. So there's, um, some good enhancements to be made, but at the same time, you know, retention, destruction, a lot of things that kind of fall away in the data lifecycle need to be addressed as well. Um, but I see all facets of those programs. So, uh, you know, get an assessment, see see where you stand, and that way you can have a definitive roadmap. Okay, thank you. Um, I got two more questions here. Uh, so, Ralph, what, what did you mean about CCPA not having a vertical? Uh, so what I mean by that, it's a little different than what we're traditionally accustomed to in the U.S., right? Typically, you know, HIPAA is addressed with the medical field, PCI for credit card processing, uh, 
you know, uh, the ones for audit, for trading, stocks, things like that. But privacy like this is is not that is not vertical specific. It won't just apply to medical. It's going to apply to everyone. And so it's it's a little different than I think we're used to seeing here in the states. Okay, great. Um, and then we have one more. Um, this one's so. <laughs> I guess it might be for, more for either one of you guys, but how, how does how does one find budget to to get this kind of project? So how have you helped some of your customers take this uh, to their board and, and get the budget approved to take on this challenge? So yeah, good question. So recently we've been doing a lot of risk analysis, um, you know, talking to, to to different CISO CIOs around their, about their program, how are they handling. Um, different areas, whether it's data protection, vulnerability management, um, you know, things like that. And then what we do is give them some quantitative risk analysis that says, you know, the confidence level of being breached over the next 12 to 18 months is 50 to 80 percent, what have you, based on our conversations. And then we say, based on historical data of the Verizon data breach, the IBM uh, information of companies that have been breached, Here's the cost per record um, for, say, a media company versus a healthcare company. You know, we can give them, you know, he, here's the actual information of what it's cost other companies. And so now they have this quantitative risk information that says, if we don't do something like data protection, uh, this could cost us upwards of, you know, $75 million based on what has happened to other people already, you know, via GDPR and other things. Um, you know, and it's going to cost you maybe 500,000 or, you know, 5 million or whatever the number is to get data protection in. But that's certainly if your risk tolerance is, is only, say, $10 million and your cyber insurance doesn't go to 75 million, then there's you can have better conversations with fiscal saying, look at what, what's happening, happening out there. Right. The CFO might say, mm, I, I get what you're saying. And those statistics, you know, are interesting. So sometimes that will help. So doing some of that quantitative risk analysis is certainly um, helpful. That's pretty neat. So we're doing, you know, this whole thing is about data privacy, but we're also, you know, making data-driven decisions. Um, that's pretty cool. Um, all right. So for those of you who are interested in, you know, or didn't have a chance to ask a question, you know, or, or you want to speak directly with Michael or Ralph, you know, we'll we'll be sending out the the slides after this. Um, make sure to send me your uh, CC, your um, ISC squared number so I can get you credit for that. But we can also, you know, have those those one-on-one -on -one conversations with this group and you know potentially look at some of these assessments and and use some of these quanti some of these uh, uh, the tools that Michael mentioned to you know bring it to your board. So with that, um, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you uh, Ralph and Stealthbits for uh, co-hosting with, with us. We, I think we had a very valuable webinar, um, informative webinar. So thank you, everyone. And uh, any last words from you guys? Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.